Edward II puts issues of gender and sexuality right up front. Our last two weeks of reading have been about, in different ways, uh, fears of effeminacy, of lack of masculinity, including the idea that heterosexuality, the love of women, makes you more feminine. A, an idea both from the classical period and from the early modern period, so that Tamburlaine is upset that one of his sons is interested in sex and not killing people and is unmanly. And Ovid, as we read last week, Ovid's Amores, translated by Marlowe, are engaged in this kind of unmanly, unmilitary, erotic adventure that, that kind of is in distinct contrast from the military, warlike, manly Roman epic model. Here we have a king of England who is effeminate. This is, oh, by the way, the only one of Marlowe's works set in England, in actual English history. We have the historical Edward II, who is, um, who comes between two uh, very militarily successful kings, his father Edward I, his son Edward III, easy to keep track in this case. He is this, he is the, he comes between much, two much more militarily successful kings. He is not as good at them at beating up the Scots, the French, etc. We, we see here, he is certainly um, a lover of luxury, of love, of effeminacy. He is also clearly the question of his sexuality comes up front and center with his deep connection to Gaveston, that he would give all the world for Gaveston, that he will threaten his kingdom for Gaveston. Here he is another character of excess, as we've seen with our other Marlowe protagonists. It is always taken to an extreme, and here it's like, get everything for Gaveston, look at me, I have all the kingdom in my hands, I give it all for Gaveston, a name that gets repeated over and over and over as a sign of his obsession, though when uh, the, the peers, when the noblemen finally get rid of Gaveston, he's simply replaced with another love object. Many people have read Edward II as having a homosexual relationship with Gaveston. This is, uh, is reasonable, and this is also combined with the accusations of homosexuality against Marlowe very late in his life by uh, uh, by Richard Baines, who's a fink, a narc, a, a, a routine government informant. We can be skeptical about Baines, but still imagine that, that Marlowe is open to all male sex. We should also recall that in this period, homosexuality is not yet a clear political or personal identity. One does not imagine oneself as exclusively gay or, or straight. One imagines oneself as turned on by various people. So we have a lot, number of people from, people from this period who clearly, including oh, at least one monarch, who function heterosexually in terms of they have a marriage, they, have, they father children, but who nonetheless have intense relationships with male favorites. It's worth remembering that just as ideas of gender change over the centuries, so do ideas of sexuality and sexual preference. Edward is certainly um, very, very committed to Gaveston, but so this opens up a queer reading. We have a play with a, an apparently queer protagonist. As you can imagine, this has attracted a lot of critical attention because it's very hard to find a queer male protagonist in Elizabethan or Jacobean drama. One of the other things that's going, here, going on historically with Edward and his nobles is the ongoing perennial problem of kings relying more on their kind of hand-chosen entourage, their favorites, or the kind of hereditary peers of the realm, the regional power magnets, how much of the government do you give to the various earls and dukes and barons, how much do you apportion out to people who you raised up to your eminence, your favorites, who 
do your bidding. This is an ongoing tension um, that would continue, th that's certainly happening in Marlowe's lifetime and afterwards in the period of, of James the, of James I and his son, Charles I. I would also point out the ending here where Edward III takes center stage at the very end is an example of the early modern theory called the, or late medieval theory, called the king's two bodies theory. The idea, a kind of legal or philosophical fiction, that the king has two bodies. Your physical, nat the body natural, which is your physical body, your actual human body, which gets sick, gets injured, um, is hungry, needs its butt wiped, maybe in Elizabeth's case, doesn't have a penis, and the body politic, which is the eternal immutable body of the king that passes down from one successor to another. So when Edward III says, I, my father speaks out of me, here's the sense that there has been an appropriate transfer of the body politic to the next heir. Don't kill the king, because he just, the kingship just moves over to the next successor, who in some way is identified. They are the same person, although they have very different physical bodies. We also have in this play two different Marlovian protagonists. We're used to these kind of overreacher characters who rise high and then get destroyed. We have our title character, we have Edward II himself, who is certainly thrown it all away in this grand these grand gestures all for love, and who has a very um, grandiose sense of his own power and authority. And we have Mortimer, who is another kind of Merlovian tr troublemaker, thug, right, who rises extremely high and then plummets right at the end. Another person who exceeds his limits, who goes above and beyond, who essentially takes over the kingdom, though he's from a much lower, he's, he's, he's in no way in the royal family. So we have another kind of Marlovian overreacher here, and they're both in trouble. We have Queen Isabel, one of the few really dominant female characters whom we will see in Marlowe, who seems to be, who is an army leader in her own right, and whom we don't punish at the end, we punish, but we don't execute at the end because she's a woman and she's the king's mother. Um, but who takes on a much more active position than we have seen anybody like Xenocrity take, um, or that we will really see again in the tragedies. One last thing. What was that last, one last thing? Um, yeah. Is that it? There's one more thing. Sorry to have the Polonius moment here. Yeah, it is, uh, we have two overreachers, the first, oh, the other thing, you will all, you might also notice, speaking of the queen, this is it, you might seem, it might seem strange that Isabel, Queen Isabel goes from like, no Mortimer, no, 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 to yes Mortimer, yes, 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 that there's a sudden pivot with this character where she wants nothing to do with that rebel, and then she is that rebel's illicit lover and co-conspirator. What's the pivot doing? This is kind of how Marlowe does his characterization. He, there's not a lot of explanation. He doesn't take us along with us. People just do take strange U-turns because they do. Because they do. This is another moment where Marlowe's characterization doesn't kind of have the depth and shading that Shakespeare persuades us is necessary. There's not a sense of that kind of, okay, psychological nuance, and you can see her move step by step towards this, towards this change, where changes happen fast, and where people are, in, to some degree, genuinely mysterious. Why did she do that? I don't know, because people are a mess. This is either this is either, as is often taken, a terrible flaw in Marlowe's characterization that that people behave inexplicably, or the minority position, exactly what works best about Marlowe's characterization, that sometimes people are inexplicable. No matter how other stories try to convince us that people are 
rational, you can explain them, and you can understand their psychology. Um, Marlowe's plays and sisters, man, sometimes people are just going to do weird stuff for no explicable reason, and you can only look at them and watch and marvel. All right, next, next week, the Jew of Malta. Whew, boy, are we going to have trouble.